I want to start the question with your uh, experience um, in the business of uh, building hotels. Now, it's very, um, uh, it's very common now to hear that most owners build hotels for, not for ROI, but for ROE, the return on ego and not return on equity, as you said. <laughs> what is your uh, uh, theory? I mean, you, you run one of the most successful hotels in uh, Delhi and CR. And your um, hotel in Jalandhar, uh, is that the other? Ludhiana. Ludhiana. Again, doing very well. What is your view of this view? Uh, rather, negative view of owners and how they perceive hotels? Um, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. I think from my point of view, I can talk about uh, us and uh, the way our group functions. Um, uh, for us, uh, we go through a very detailed uh, financial analysis of you know, how the project is actually positioned. Uh, return on ego comes in later. So of course, I come in as a second generation entrepreneur. So it could be expected that the girl wants to be in hospitality. So let's just get into it. It's a little bit more glamorous than, you know, probably education, which we currently are in uh, as well. But that's not the case. I think the way we've been groomed uh, uh, internally, the way my education has gone through, and the way each team member in our team is uh, configured, um, of course, there is a gut feel that you start off with that is this project going to make sense or not? And then, of course, with that, we go in for a complete detailed deliberation of the kind of product that's going to actually suit that particular location. What is the prognosis of, uh, you know, the revenues that I'm going to derive from there? How is the expense side going to look in at? How my sources of funds are going to come in? Um, then we go in for further detailed analysis on the cash flow side. Uh, so, you know, to really understand. So sometimes what happens is there is a proper return on investment, oblique return on equity, whatever way you want to look at it. Um, would the group be able to manage the cash flows to actually fund the project? Then what are the other sources? Maybe debt, maybe private equity. Private equity is something that we, we have not, uh, you know, ventured into at this point of time. So we go through a very detailed exercise. And so I can tell you case in point, like in Noida, we have singularly a hotel. But for Ludhiana, we came up with a mixed-use development. And uh, which was predominantly with the reason that we knew that hotel in itself could not sustain the cash flows required to first make the project and also to get the adequate returns out of the entire development. And hence the mall was actually plonked into that. So that gave us a very good kind of a combination project. And then now we're actually developing our Bangalore project, which is uh, again going to be a mixed use development. Again, we came up with the understanding the hotel in itself would not be able to sustain uh, the required return on investment that we as uh, uh, ownership were looking in at. So we combined it with residences because that's where the market gap actually stood at. So. Um, I can't talk about anybody else, but I know from our point of view, the way our DNA is inclined in the group, that we go with a gut feel and then it has to be backed with a very detailed financial rigmarole that we go through, iterations that we go through, and that's what it is. Just return on ego is something that I think is a passe concept. All new generation, second generation, third generation entrepreneurs know that to survive in the long run, they have to have a financial understanding of where the project is going to actually lead you to. So that's what I feel it no, is. I always wanted to ask be. you this question, but uh, you know, I never got an opportunity. Why did you choose Noida? You know, and that was how many years ago? About 14 years ago, 15 yes, years about ago. 14 years and ago. And the construction must have started in the mid 90s, you know. Uh, yeah, about yeah, yeah. three years before that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So now, uh, why did you choose Noida? What uh, and you know, you've shown that it works, you know, sort of. Well, uh, I must give all this credit to my father, actually, because he actually procured the land before I actually started working. And uh, I think he had this uh, enormous, uh, you know, kind of a visionary uh, ideas. Being a hardcore education uh, uh, person, uh, he thought that Noida was a place where the market gap actually existed. So all credits to him. So as I said, an entrepreneur needs that gut feel. So he had that in him. And then, of course, uh, uh, he saw when he actually got market survey and also probably went around looking himself that there was a huge potential coming in from the corporate sector, which was sitting around that time. But unfortunately, there was no organized product in terms of hospitality available. 
Uh, even if it was, it was in probably a two or three star, very unstructured category. So that's how we got the idea of entering in. And then I joined him uh, midway when the construction had started and I tried to give him my own little inputs uh, here and there and uh, um, you know, uh, went about this uh, entire exercise. And I think now with the great idea of entering into a market which was completely virgin, coupled with I think the excellent team I had, I think we're doing, uh, by God's grace, a phenomenal job for the hotel. Great. You know, and, uh, uh, can you tell me a bit about your background, your own education, and you know, uh, bef before we let, let the experts come in and <laughs> shoot their questions? You know? <laughs> okay. Uh, surprisingly, of course, I started my career with the hotels. I'm not a hotel school graduate from any side. Mm. Uh, but well, you're a finance uh, graduate. Uh, yes, yes, I I've uh, did my schooling in Delhi, yeah. and then I went in to do my BCom honors from Jesus and Mary College. And um, finance has been a subject that I have particularly. Uh, about the uh, not really uh, returning those ARRs which mm -hmm. hotels would be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you see a lot of mixed use properties and you know a lot of residences? Like we have seen uh, I, even ITC Grand Chola, I think the main mm -hmm. business is now coming out of the residences. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, is that going to happen a lot uh, in, in the southern markets? Uh, well, um, yes, in mm. South there has been a lot of uh, dilution which has happened mm. of ARR and Hyderabad particularly because of mm. Telangana and Chennai has also had dilution. But mm. Bangalore, for that matter, has been one of the uh, top of the line markets for investment mm. in uh, hospitality, commercial spaces mm -hmm. or residential. I mean, there are various surveys to back mm. it up. and. Uh, uh, however, if I were to talk about on a general level, um, hotels are very, very capital intensive. Yeah. I think uh, the gentleman here would be uh, able to support me on that. And uh, capital intensive, uh, particularly from the point of view that the land is an asset has become a class to become, uh, it's become more and more expensive mm -hmm. class to actually acquire. And for a hotel, if you don't have a good location, you're not going to do well. And that goes without saying. So if you're going to have a good location, the land as an asset is going to come at a very expensive price. And then there is construction cost, which is going to be almost same wherever you build a hotel. So if I were to look at the financials of what it's going to draw uh, from uh, post its operation, hotel in itself, in all parts of India, are un unable to garner the cash flows or return on investment to survive on its own. Mm -hmm. And hence you see, uh, mixed-use developments coming in. You see a lot of trend of uh, developers, oblique operators adding on residences, malls, commercial complexes, because hotels in itself are unable to survive on their own. So that's a trend across India. Now coming back to South India, uh, yes, there's been a dilution in Hyderabad and Chennai, but in Bangalore, it still remains a very strong market. And I can say particularly from the market gap that we see as a group in Whitefield area. Mm -hmm. uh, Whitefield is the area of, because of which Bangalore came on the world map. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the IT, ITES sitting there. But unfortunately or fortunately, there is no luxury product available there. You basically have either mid-market or the first class five-star hotels available there. So that's a market gap that we saw. And hence, we ventured to thought of the idea of getting into a luxury hotel. Mm -hmm. And then we coupled it with a luxury residences because of the fact that you know, you, all these ITITS companies have these lot of huge expat inflows which come in who temporarily sit with a company for, let's say, a year or two. And they probably want to invest in an asset which gives them all the frills of a hotel, mm -hmm. yet it's not as expensive to stay in a hotel as a long-staying guest. So that's how I'm just giving you a very broad nutshell of how we brought about this idea. And it made a lot of financial sense. So for Bangalore, that's the product combination we came up with. So if we come up with Goa or any other place later, we will be sticking to a mixed-use development because I know with hotel in itself, we'll not be able to survive. We'd be on a huge drain on cash flows mm -hmm. and the reserves of the company. Right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Vivek, you know, you being a financial advisor and you have a, you have a banking experience, uh, you know, why didn't you start the discussion? Well, yeah, I think uh, you've pretty much covered everything. Uh, so we could probably head for lunch. Um, but let me just give a little two-second background. So, you know, I've not only been, um, uh, like you rightfully said, a banker for a couple of years, but uh, we set up a fund back in 2006 and probably one of the first people to invest in 
hospitality at that time. Uh, and then I had the privilege of working for a brand as well uh, for four years. I ran Fairmont Raffles uh, development efforts here in, in India. So I think two, three points I'll touch upon. I think the key is land. Uh, land is prohibitively expensive in this country uh, for a number of reasons, including the inefficiencies of just acquiring land and licensing and so on and so forth. That uh, I think today to build a city center hotel only project in any city in this country, uh, ground up, uh, will not be feasible uh, at land, at prices where they are. And if I think one of the panelists who hasn't joined us today, I was going to use this example. Um, in the 2002 2003 disinvestment cycle, the people who came in at that time have made great money. So it's about timing the cycle and getting that land before it sort of popped up uh, to levels where it's become unfeasible. Um, so it's a combination of getting in at the right price on the land, and the other thing is uh, also the right time of the cycle. Because you may get a good deal on the land, but you build up, and with all the execution challenges, spend four, five, six years building a big project and catch the wrong end of that cycle, uh, your capital structure can get distorted for quite a while. And then you're playing catch up. And I think one of the key, another thing that I'd like to add here is that the hotel is not only just a real estate asset, it's an operating business as well. So you've got to keep reinvesting into hotels. And I think uh, you know, if you start playing catch up on your capital structure, uh, it comes at the expense of that reinvestment. And then you know, it, it's a sort of vicious circle uh, on the down, downward side. And uh, I do agree, mixed use is probably the way to go. Uh, it's not easy from a regulatory perspective. There are always a lot of uh, gray areas in terms of can you sell, can you not, can you do a lease, can you, you know, what will be the, uh, so, um, so I think hopefully there's gonna be some, there should be some clarity from a regulatory perspective that allow it. I think, I'll give you an example in Australia, they have one of the most advanced, uh, uh, you know, regulations out there for, uh, for strata titling. Uh, residential units uh, and hotels. Mm. Um, and this is something that they saw as an interesting way to finance these hotels. So we're a long way behind on that. We're talking about it. I've, I know when I worked for Fairmont, we did a project not very far from you in Noida, which never came up, but uh, we spent uh, eight, ten months trying to structure it, and I couldn't, couldn't get our heads around it. So structuring, because of the opaqueness of our regula uh, regulations, also provides a big challenge uh, to be creative. On the financing yeah, part. If you see yeah. the market uh, buzz, you know, that the Lodi, for instance, it has been trying to become a mixed use property for a long time, you know, but uh, they have, even uh, the Leela Chanakya Puri, they thought that will be one of the bailout uh, packages to turn, uh, to be able to sell their apartments, you know. Yeah. But I think they're all uh, stuck in some uh, regulatory logjam or the other, you know, sort of. Uh, Sonic, what is your, you know, I mean, whenever you go to any hoteliers forum, they keep complaining about the regulatory environment, you know, and that is, uh, I think, um, from an owner's perspective, uh, how do you perceive it and what needs to be done? Like, what is the number one priority area in this uh, domain? You know? um, I think you've kind of got it bang on, uh, of course, uh, apart from licensing issues, if I want to probably talk of a bit on the macro side. Mm. Um, on one end, the government is talking about getting tourism into India and making it a hub. But how am I going to support tourism if the industry, which is hotel industry, is not going to be supported? And uh, case in point, I think one of the most hotly contested um, issue is why aren't we able to give hotels an industry status? Um, if I get a status, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, primary and secondary benefits which come along with that. And the primary one being that is the rate of interest. Uh, my rate of interest, which is astoundingly high at this point of time. First of all, it's not lucky for hotel owners to get, um, you know, debt financing. Uh, 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 you know, most banks are really awry. And even if I get, it is it at exorbitant price because I'm considered technically a real estate. Mm. So from one point of view, I think we need to be considered as an industry and hence we get all the SOPs related to it. And once that happens, I think there will be a certain amount of easing out that will uh, uh, come about. So I think primarily if I want to hit uh, uh, on the head of the nail, I would want that we should get an industry status mm. and um, uh, get all the benefits uh, okay. attached to it. You know, Mandeep, you know, uh, 
as far as I can remember, uh, you know, at least I can talk about 20 years, I've been hearing about this industry status. You know? And you know, our common friend Said Shirwani, you know, I keep talk, talking about that you know, you know, so, why, uh, why is the reluctance of the government across party affiliations uh, to uh, support the industry status? Um, <clears throat> you know, it's really uh, funny in a manner and sad in the other that uh, when I first started attending industry forums some 25 years ago, um, we were talking of exactly the same thing that we are talking of today. Nothing has changed. We've been talking about regulatory issues then. We've been talking about single window clearances then. We've been talking about high rate of uh, debt. So nothing has changed. Today the problem, singular problem that lies or this industry suffers from is what Sonika just pointed out, is the rate at which we borrow. We have to service debt at an average of about 12% today in a tenure of 8 years and the yield that I'll get if I build a hotel will be 6% or 7% if I'm lucky. So as a starter, it's a no-brainer that you've got, you're going to get 7%, you have to serve, uh, you service your interest at 12%. The trouble continues to be that for some reason, you know, India is a very large country. We've had multiple, multiple issues to deal with. But perception-wise, the hospitality industry is considered by the political class in this country to be an elitist industry. Right? It is a playground for the rich and the famous. Not, uh, you know, really understanding... Um, actually... I'm not sure that they don't understand, but I think perception-wise, in a sort of environment that we have, it serves their purpose to continue to keep us labeled, uh, you know, as a sort of elitist industry, uh, you know, where it's only for the rich and the famous, uh, forgetting that a very large part of this industry is actually, you know, the one, two, three star hotels, which are very, very important to the infrastructure. If we are going to have an economy, which is threatening to grow at 7, 8, 9 percent. And if we don't keep our pace by creating accommodation that we need to do across the various sectors, I mean, there's, it's, it's going to be just a mayhem there. Then we've sort of missed the gravy train and what are we talking about here? We've had huge inadequacy of rooms. We've just built some capacity over the last five or six years, which is where the industry has seen some pain because the capacity is being sort of absorbed um, and now we'll see um, a better run. But I think the government somehow has failed repeatedly to give us the infrastructure status which we really should be getting because hotels certainly are part of infrastructure development. The minute we get infrastructure status, the lending rates will come down and more than the lending rates coming down, the tenure in which we have to repay that loan goes up. Right? And that's what, because hotels, as she said, is very capital intensive. It takes three, four, five years for the hotel to sort of stabilize and settle down. And if you're going to service your debt in those five years after you've opened, I mean, so there's a catastrophe for disaster. This is what we're seeing. Hotels are so stressed. Um, Leela has 5,000 crores of debt, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Accumulated debt which they can't service. If I was to do, and this is part of what we do, if I was to map the country and look at hotels, and Vivek would probably know some of that, is without even batting an eyelid, I think there would be over a hundred hotels which are just available for sale because they're so stressed. Mm -hmm. And that's the environment. Um, but the trouble is that again, when you are stressed and the yield that you are getting for a buyer is five or six percent, and the debt continues to be 12 percent, where are the buyers? Yeah. As against to, let's say, more, you know, developed markets, let's take UK or London, for example. If you were to buy a hotel in London, you'd get the yield mm -hmm. of 3%. As against 6% in India, mm -hmm. or 7% even if you're lucky, mm -hmm. but cost of borrowing is 1.75%. Financial. Financial. So, you know, so that's how it works. Right. And that's where we are missing. So, I think... There was a lot of hope when Mr. Modi came to power. He seemed to be <coughs> the first Prime Minister who was talking about tourism. And he spoke about it becoming one of the pillars, etc. And there was a lot of hope that when uh, you know, he settles down, we'll see some stuff happening. 
regretfully um, as always this budget you know you have to scan the i don't know 4 500 pages that the budget is normally and you'll never find the tourism word in no. it this, this this budget is nothing for tourism you know absolutely you know um so uh, vivek what does it mean you know um, like uh, you know um, are operators like um, uh, you know owners like sonika who are in the luxury space Will they soon become like history? You know, like will the luxury space just give? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> so will will the luxury space have no relevance in in a market like this? You know? At least there'll be awards for bravery. Yeah, <laughs> she she deserves <laughs> she deserves the next one, machine. You know? <laughs> okay, you know the industry is cyclical. So uh, as as Bandeep said, we had. 2003 onwards, I, I, I mean, we've tracking about $2.6 billion of foreign direct investment that came into uh, hospitality. And, you know, unfortunately came in at the term when the, when the economy started to slow down, or when it started, at least when the project started coming online, 2007, 2008, uh, you know, we experienced a sort of a cyclical slowdown. So uh, these things are cyclical. So you had this huge capacity increase uh, on the back of uh, you know uh, you know lower and slower demand, uh, so this will turn around. Though I do think we have some structural problems currently, and um, uh, I think it's it's going to be it's going to remain painful for the next couple of years. Uh, and I think you need to be smart if you're building a project today, ground up. You need to be smart. You need to look at you know you need to look at uh, mixed use more than just mixed use and just things like residential or commercial i think owners need to be more innovative with figuring out how do they monetize uh, other parts of their assets how do they drive additional revenue streams from this other part of this asset and i think operators need to play a role there as well i think they need to you know take the blinders off and say okay how do we make, work with the owners to see how do we to create additional revenue streams for the owners to make it uh, feasible the key here is uh, land cost as well i mean you know if you're holding historically a uh, land cost at a historical level uh, you know then i think it's it's okay but today uh, if you're buying uh, if you're buying uh, you know a, a new hotel uh, or a new piece of land to build a hotel i think you need to be very creative to try and make it work uh, i personally think it's a it's a buy versus build strategy today so if you are uh, looking to allocate capital this is probably a good time to buy uh, existing assets that are in trouble that are half complete or, or even complete and not being able to service uh, you know, the debt uh, burden that they have from their existing cash flow. So I don't think this business is gone. I think we're going to have four or five years of, uh, I think it's going to sort of plateau for another four or five years and, uh, and the economy will pick up. As Mandeep said, you know, we're growing at seven, eight percent. Uh, the hospitality business globally and in India is eight, nine percent of GDP, uh, you know, travel and tourism as a whole, not, not only hospitality. So the hotels are a very key part of that infrastructure. So uh, we're not going anywhere. The business is not going to go anywhere. But people are going to struggle continuously. And it's those that don't identify this soon enough. I mean, from the owner's perspective, uh, they might miss the boat. And what I mean is, now's the time to recapitalize, uh, make yourself relevant again, and and uh, you know give yourself another inning uh, to survive sort of that that uh, or, or to flourish in the next up cycle. You know. So, Sonika, is your your company still a privately held company? Uh, and you, and you said that you're not looking at outside uh, investment. You know, uh, what prevents you from going public or you know getting PE investments? You know, sort of. Um, I think for one, there is a trajectory involved. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people just jump the gun and you know try and get private equity in. I think. Uh, for one, we have not uh, fully tapped and uh, utilized debt as a source of finance, which is probably cheaper than equity, and uh, which I think the gentleman here would be able to uh, tell me a bit, uh, I mean, they can uh, probably uh, vouch on that. Um, debt, we're not a very debt aggressive mm -hmm. company. So I think once I've probably come up to a level that I've actually fully utilized debt as a source of finance in the company, then I would probably like to you know, put my hands into equity, uh, which is probably at uh, at least 1.5 times the cost of that of debt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'll come at hurdle levels of about at least 20, 22% at the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. So I haven't reached that level yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I'm very, uh, uh, you know, 
it's a very conscious decision to remain privately held versus publicly mm -hmm. held. Mm -hmm. What happens is the moment I go into becoming a public listed company, of course I can monetize my assets and you know dilute mm -hmm. a certain amount of my equity and get monies and reserves uh, into our personal hands or into the company. However, we lose control. Now what happens is in course of increasing my return on let's say uh, equity and you know publish very nice astounding results, a lot of public listed companies try to go aggressive on debt. So they keep on increasing debt because it means that's a cheaper source of finance, the return on equity increases because I need to publish better results, my stock trading needs to happen at good pricing. I don't want to get into that rigmarole right now. Let me have a full control. I don't want to go over aggressive, consciously get into projects, give a growth internally to uh, stakeholders, which makes sense, rather than just try and pump up profits, you know, unnecessarily. So I think right now, one, I have not fully exhausted my current financing options to go public. And number two, I think control is the way and going conservative is a way right now in these troubled environment. So that's how we look at it at this point of time internally in the company, yeah. Uh, Vivek, uh, uh, what's your uh, view? <coughs> I mean, sh see, uh, to a hotel company, you know, uh, like uh, Sonicus, what would you uh, advise? What would your top advice be today, you know? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not, I think you've got two or three hotels. Uh, mm. is, is, that, is that accurate? Yeah, so um, I, I don't think now is the time to look for, if you're self-funded, uh, now is not the time to look. I think, you know, you only really get the, the upside of valuation with scale, really. And I, I don't think there are any really platforms today in India that are ready to go public, mm -hmm. other than those uh, that are uh, already public. And, right. you know, maybe Lemon Tree is a, Lemon is tree a platform is that's there, but they still haven't done it. And mm. they're at, uh, you know, Sami is the next mm. one, that, uh, and Lemon Tree will be the next one. Right. But I think you... Public markets uh, will only really uh, give you that valuation mm -hmm. when you have scale. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it'll be a while. I think unless you do a roll-up strategy and buy a lot of hotels and build a portfolio of you know, mm -hmm. 15, 20, 25 hotels, uh, I think then only then does it make sense to uh, sing. In terms of private equity, I don't really see any real private equity interest mm -hmm. other than in, in I don't like using this word, but in the distress space. Okay. Uh, but uh, transactions, Mandeep runs that for JLL on the transaction side. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's tough to get transactions done because people hold on to their assets because they think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, uh, you know, the turnaround is right around the corner, which hasn't been the case. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I think on private equity, people are only coming in if they can get a huge discount to mm -hmm. replacement costs or... Uh, and you know, if you look at valuation metrics like a multiple and EBITDA or a yield or what have you, you can't even have a conversation. <laughs> uh, it's literally 40, 50% of replacement costs or f of what they've built. Yeah. So, um, uh, so today the transactions, I think there is capital there. I think there's that $2.8 billion that's gone in that needs to get an exit and it'll happen. It'll happen over the next, uh, you know, six, eight, 12, 18 months, Mandeep, hopefully sooner than, uh, than that. But uh, Today the conversations are very difficult right. and few and far between. Yeah. So, <coughs> Manti, what's your prognosis? I mean, in this short term, you know, is it going to happen in this 18-month period? Or <laughs> because we are always told, you know, like in, in the case of hotels, you know, of course I'm borrowing a term uh, which belongs to Mr. Modi's, but, uh, you know, this Ache Din was supposed to come many years ago, you know, so, uh, much, so we can't take <laughs> blame anyone particular, but, you know, the Ache Din haven't come yet, you know, sort of. Um, so, so. Yeah. Other than for Mr. Modi himself, I don't think much of the Ache Din have arrived yet. But a uh, couple of things that I'll probably list out here uh, on, on the sort of hospitality space in India. Um, one is, um, like Vivek was saying a little while ago, I think that a lot of hotel investors are clearly realizing the advantage of acquiring against building. Uh, I think the development risk in this country is pretty severe because of all the regulatory issues that you go through. First acquiring land, then converting it, and then the sort of series of permissions, sanctions, etc. that you have to deal with. Um, the average length of building a hotel, um, you know, the time taken to build a hotel tends to be anywhere around four years. Mm. 
Um, so, um, a lot of invest investors are now realizing that it's probably worth the acquisition and if it comes at a premium, so be it. The good news for them is that at this moment in time, it's not coming at a premium, it's coming at a discount. Mm. So, this is probably a good time uh, for those who are looking at this industry and uh, l wanting to be players in this industry uh, to start acquiring assets. Um, a lot of people in this room may be surprised to know that 2015 we saw the largest amount of transactions of vanilla individual assets than we've seen in the last 20 years. Right? Um, and it happened silently without many people getting to know. Um, and I think uh, the total size was about a half a billion dollars, not a lot of money. Uh, considering that at JLL we sold one hotel in Hong Kong for one billion dollars. Uh, that was the intercontinental in Hong Kong, but never mind that. Um, in India, it was still a fairly large sum of. And my sense is that in 2016, uh, you will see um, a much greater uh, number of transactions taking place than we saw in 2015. The space seems to be getting a little active. Uh, and of course, uh, again, like Vivek was seeing, we're not seeing too much of the IPO stuff, I think Lemon Tree and Sammy, in my opinion, are both 2018, uh, probably, um, which will be the next sort of largish companies. Um, companies build over a very short span of time, especially Sammy, which has just been around for five years, mm -hmm. and have acquired um, close to 25 assets. Yes. So, uh, they are going aggressive that's, in the acquisition. That's a phenomenal story. Um, yeah, they are completely um, mm -hmm. going the acquisition route. Um, and they've managed to, um, you know, collect, raise um, a whole lot of equity uh, from very, very credible sources. So, of course, there are stories uh, like, again, coming back to what Vivek is saying, the industry isn't going anywhere. There's a lot that's going to happen. We're going to see demand at a much higher uh, level than we've seen in the past because of the, the sort of supply now getting petered off. Um, and I think the next five or six years uh, is going to be the up cycle. Uh, we've seen almost seven, eight years of a down cycle, which has probably been the severest that we've seen in the industry, yeah. I think, in its history. Um, and we will now see an up cycle. As, but there are still a lot of impediments. Um, you know, capital is still hard to find in, in hotels. Um, you know, banks don't lend very easily. Hotels is a bad word, uh, you know, for the banking sector. Uh, there have been loads of defaults. We've got all the asset uh, reconstruction companies now looking at hotels, but not a lot has happened on that. Very recently, there was a Taj uh, in Calcutta, which was put um, on, an, on, on a bid by uh, Edelweiss, uh, and not even one bid came uh, at the reserve price in the metro city of Calcutta for a brand like Taj. So we have aberrations in the system. Uh, these will continue to happen again. Uh, there's a lot of private equity wanting to exit. They have, you know, lived, gone beyond their shelf life, um, you know, and, and they're just hanging in there to find an exit. So you'll see um, in the next 12 to 18 months for sure a fair amount of activity um, that's going to happen. Um, what valuations are going to look like is anybody's guess. But I think acquisitions today are going to happen at a discount on replacement cost. I don't see acquisitions happening on the typical, um, you know, uh, more mature markets where there are EBITDA multiples um, or on discounted cash flows. Those will probably, in, in, in India, you can probably have those transactions maybe in a Mumbai or a Bangalore for a very, very mature asset. But in most other markets, we are looking at acquisitions happening at a discount to the replacement cost, which basically means that if I was to go to, let's say, um, Ahmedabad to buy a hotel and I'm evaluating a hotel, then I will do a number which tells me if I was to build this hotel today, what will it cost me? And assuming, let's say, I come to a figure of 80 crores or 100 crores, this is going to cost me if I build it today, what is the cost at which I can acquire this? The advantage to me is that I save the time of four years or three or four years to build my speed to market. The minute I buy it, I have cash flows coming in. Uh, and, and today, in most places, uh, you will get a discount to uh, the replacement cost. So it's interesting from that perspective if you can strike a good deal. So I think interesting times moving forward for the industry. We will see a fair amount of movement happening. 
there's also globally a lot of you know interesting time we're seeing this whole battle between um, you know the buyout of starwood between marriott and the chinese conglomerate it's going flip flop flip flop um, and the starwood shares are going up and up uh, and they're probably having the last laugh on this one but uh, and there's a lot of others so there's um, you know Accor uh, trying to acquire Carlson um, and Accor recently bought Fairmont. Um, so there's a lot of consolidation happening globally uh, and that's going to change uh, a lot of things uh, in the, in the, in the um, you know, global uh, hospitality industry and of course in India as well. Um, but for investors like Sonica, thank God for them, and thank God they're still <laughs> they're still investing, and, uh, and 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 these are the mature investors. These are not the investors who are getting swayed by ego returns or swayed by anything else. They've obviously taken their time. They've been around 15 years. You know, they've, they've sort of learned it, understood it, and done it gradually. Mm. I don't think there is a rush of blood here to you know go and sort of acquire 10 hotels or 15 hotels or build or, or raise debt, uh, you know, and leverage yourself, etc. So uh, that's how I think a lot of Indian investors are. The other thing in India, just to conclude before I go, is is that culturally our problem in India is that we don't sell businesses. Right? It's considered to be very, very infradic to sell a business. It's linked to failure. Right? I've sold my business means I failed. And what will the society and the world say about me? Unlike the West where the minute they see that it's not working out, they don't put good money over bad. Here, we will keep on putting good money over bad or the whole system will collude with us. The banking system doesn't want it to be NPA. They will refinance it. I'll go from one bank to the other to the other and keep playing the game and waiting for the call. You know, that you know things will change um, and 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 just sit on an asset which is just getting depleted and the value is getting depleted and you're sort of just burning your fingers but uh, things will change we've seen a couple of deals recently we saw the sale of the higher agency in Pune, where the where the owners actually took a very massive haircut they got no money in the deal the only guys yeah, it take them three years to make that deal. But finally, they realize that, listen, they may have put money into the hotel, but because of the debt and the stress they were in, they actually did not get any money. That hotel sold for 430 crores. All the money went to the bank. Owners didn't get anything. There was a four-point Sheraton which sold in Vishakhapatnam. The owner had to sell his, ha sell his cinema to bring in more money to get the deal closed. But that's reality. And we're learning the reality in the Indian marketplace as well, which is good news. Owners will start realizing to be prudent and get on with life. And if your asset isn't performing and you don't have the ability and you don't have the deep pockets to handle the asset, get out of it. Great, I think, very good. <coughs> but, um, um, you know, uh, one last word, uh, uh, Sonika, you know, what is your next big plan? Which is the next big hotel coming up after Bangalore? Well, um, after Bangalore, I think it's going to be Goa. But uh, I think if uh, the government opens up acquisition funding, which is, you know, banks cannot lend for acquisition, probably I can acquire 15 ago. <laughs> but if that happens, it'll be a much bigger game. But if it doesn't, then it'll be one step at a time. So it'll be Goa and then Greater Noida.